Welcome back to Subject to Cross. I'm Caroline Donato. And I am Pete Kratza. And I have uh, an announcement to make. You're not allowed to make it. No one's going to believe it. So we just interviewed investigator Greg Ald and went off the air. He said, unsolicited, that he likes me just as much as Pete, if not more. (laughs) That's so false. I'm not even going to dignify it with a response. The listeners can, you know, listen to the prior podcast and uh, hear what he actually said. And then before he left... Maybe you should be a little bit more introspective in terms of why he answered that way. And then when he left... Instead of trying to bully him into changing his answer. And then when he left, he actually called me his favorite. Oh, my God. That's so not true. It was nice. Yeah. I feel good about this now. All right. We good. can move on and feel positive. Okay. We don't have to have hurt feelings. I gave you <laughs> that Mary prefers working with you. I did. I know. And you know in in, in, in your heart. You're easier than me to deal with for Greg. Greg. I know. Greg likes. Well, I mean I'm a likable guy. You're easier to deal with. Right. You're not as you're not as detail persnickety as me. Persnickety. Persnickety. What are we talking about? We're talking about an interesting article that I ran across because I do all the research for this podcast um, regarding the Justice Department's civil division sending a letter to the Pennsylvania courts. It's the uh, uh, UJS, the Unified Judicial System in Pennsylvania, regarding the practice in certain counties of uh, either limiting or uh, precluding people who have what is an ADA, uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, recognized disability, opioid use disorder. These courts have either limited or completely uh, prevented uh, those with opioid use disorder, which I will call OUD from now on, um, from taking their uh, prescribed medication. In the it's tre- really interesting. In the me. treatment courts. So let's... Well, treatment courts end, if you bothered to read the article. I did. The See all those highlights? The one county, uh, the judge, uh, it was a was it Jefferson County? It was a county with one judge. Um, yeah. I, I love... Th- this is from the letter from the Department of Justice. The Honorable John Foradora is the presiding dash and only... Dash, judge for the Jefferson <laughs> County Court of Common Pleas. Well, he issued an order that said that an administrative order saying that anybody under court supervision, so regular probationers or parolees, uh, would have to be completely clean of any opiate based treatment medication within 30 days of being sentenced. And basically, the Department of Justice, this is back in 2018. Oh, that confused me because it says within 30 days of being sentenced. So I was assuming it's a pre-trial diversionary tri- type program, um, ARD is one of those, but it also includes probation, parole. Any, anybody on supervision. Okay. Well, that's but, confusing if it's 30 days prior to sentencing because probation and parole no, would... Within 30 days of being sentenced. Of being, so in other oh, words, once they're under sentenced. supervision, uh, they had to be clean within 30 days. But the interesting part about that, you know, they're, they're providing the Department of Justice in this letter examples of... Uh, of Pennsylvania courts who have either limited or precluded the use of the medication. You all right over there? Yeah. Well, oh, okay. All right. You're just like, I just want to make sure. You're okay. She kicked me. All right. Just want to make sure you're not going into labor or anything. <laughs> no. I, I wouldn't know what to do. She just abuses um, me throughout the day. Do the listeners know you're pregnant? Now they do. <laughs> oh, all right. Did I violate like an ADA thing? Well, that's not a disability. Well, that would be a HIPAA thing. That would be a HIPAA thing. Did I violate HIPAA? You're just looking at me. Are you going to sue me? I just wanted to see how far you would go. Uh, so whatever. Um, this judge received a letter from the Department of Justice uh, on December 21st, and later the same day um, he vacated his order. So I think the letter from the Department of Justice got his attention. But they reference other counties. This well, can letter. We, can we broad scope uh, this so real you quick? Always, you let me take the lead, and then you tell me I'm not doing it the right way. You're doing it well, but I always think you're going to – you know, hit the high point and then step back. And yeah, but I don't do it that way. I just want to give the listeners some understanding. So listeners, this is why when, when Caroline will say to me, why don't you take the lead on this podcast? They'll be like, 
that's like it's like my wife asking my opinion. Seriously. I mean, go ahead. I go want right you ahead. to succeed. Sorry, Jen. Go right ahead. Well, you did you did find this article and to your credit, you do do a lot of the research. The Justice Department started an investigation into the courts of Pennsylvania and how they treat the use of prescription medication when it comes to people who have opioid use disorder. And basically that means if you're in a treatment program or if you're um, sentenced and um, under probation or on parole, if you're using your prescription medication in certain counties, you can get in trouble. And that's a discrimination against a person with a disability, which is, in this case, opioid use disorder. Go ahead, Pete. I'm having a flashback. It's like deja vu. I said all that. You said it in, like, very all-over-the-place words. Mm -hmm. That's how I speak. Um, So the letter is basically uh, not so much – I guess they're kind of directing. uh, They're also kind of threatening – these Pennsylvania courts um, with, we hope to work cooperatively cooperatively with you to resolve the department's findings in this matter. If the UJS declines to enter into voluntary compliance negotiations, or if our negotiations are unsuccessful, the United States may take appropriate action. And then it cites to the statutes. Um, And this letter is dated February 2nd, so it's within this month of 2022. And the other thing to keep in mind with this letter is there were two complaints, two complainants that came out of two basic counties, but out of these complainants, their investigation yielded policies that are discriminatory in at least six counties in UJS, which is the Unified Judicial System of Pennsylvania. Pete, how many counties are actually oh, in UJS? Like 50-something? I don't know how many counties are. I used to know. How so they're, they're looking at this, and they're referencing the policies that are written And it kind of makes you scratch your head. How about those policies that are not written, but they're enforced in other counties? Yeah. Um, Perhaps in ours. Um, But, you know, the the issue here, it seems to me, is the courts not recognizing OUD. Like, for instance, if somebody has diabetes and they're taking a diabetes medicine, our courts would never... Um, intervene. But it's these OUDs and the medicines that that, uh, are prescribed. And I think that judges, prosecutors, probation officers, and sometimes they reference a treatment team here, um, you know, sometimes drug and alcohol counselors, kind of look very superficially and skeptically, not in that order, skeptically and superficially, um, regarding some of these medi- medicines, they're talking about methadone, now naltrexone, buprenorphine, which is subutex, and suboxone, which I, we've seen a lot. So these are medicines approved by the FDA to treat OUD. And basically, the, the Justice Department is telling uh, uh, the Pennsylvania courts, you're not allowed to prevent people from taking these drugs And not only are you not allowed to prevent them from taking the drugs, you can't deny them equal access to programs like treatment courts, what we call drug court here, Um, you know, to to have them make a choice, basically, either get off of this stuff or um, don't get this diversionary program. A diversionary program is to refresh the listeners' memories. Basically, that's an opportunity, like a drug court, for instance, or a treatment court, as they call them in, in some counties. It's an opportunity to have your charges dismissed. You know, you go through Or your treatment. sentence to be less or than. Your, or your sentence to be lessened. But the, the diversionary uh, component is basically that you avoid convictions. And what they're saying is you can't deny somebody that opportunity um, on the basis of discriminating against them, um, you know, for their OUD. It's, it's kind of groundbreaking, game-changing, I would say. You know, here in our county, um, and again, we promised people we wouldn't read, uh, name any names. We asked whether they're abiding by this letter, and and they didn't really want to comment. That the I think that um, they're reviewing it. Um, I haven't had somebody go through drug court in recent memory, anyway, on um, 
on any of these medicines. I do kind of have a vague recollection of them saying you got to get off of that stuff if you're going to be in drug court. So here was my thought on that. And after reading this and reading the DOJ's letter, I woke up this morning and sent Pete a slew of texts. You were spamming me. To which he did not respond. That's right. I don't reply to spam. And so what I was thinking about in terms, so I have clients in treatment court and drug court. And oftentimes, actually, I'll get retained while a client is having trouble with drug court and about to get kicked out of drug court. And the drug court is a pretrial diversion. So if you're kicked out of it, then you're prosecuted for your your original charges. And I'll speak to the opioid use. I had a client who was extremely addicted to opioids and had significant mental health issues. It was a very complicated picture. And um, part of this client's release conditions from prison was to do a drug and alcohol evaluation through the county and follow recommended treatment. The DOJ's letter, let me separate that for a second. Let me put a pin in that. The DOJ's letter talks about people who have opioid use disorder and are currently prescribed medication for for opioid use disorder. But how about those people who have a drug addiction, who have opioid use disorder and need that prescription, and they're forced to go through the county drug and alcohol evaluation and treatment process that will not give that prescription? or suggest that prescription, because my client, who did go through this process recently and had such a severe disorder, I mean, I'd never seen anything so tragic, and this client so desperately, like complainant A and B in this letter, wanted help, as soon as this client was released from an inpatient facility, she relapsed and and died. And I can't help but read this letter and think if our treatment programs, if our drug and alcohol programs would properly diagnose opioid use disorder and treat it. And it's not just the people who already come into these programs already diagnosed and treated, but people who need to be diagnosed and treated. That would also be something for the the UJS to consider. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that the the counter argument to that is that your client was free to get treatment independent of the county in terms of, you know, if, if she or her family uh, thought that that these drugs should be considered, she could find a physician to to uh, prescribe it. You know, I, I think that, uh, I'm listen, I say about lawyers, we weren't smart enough to go to medical school. Maybe you were, but I, you know, uh, I think most lawyers weren't smart enough to go to medical school. So the, the point here is that judges lawyer who are lawyers and other lawyers shouldn't be interfering with a patient physician um, relationship. If you have a doctor, you know, my dad was a psychiatrist, right? So, and I, I always would tell, I tell clients now that to the extent that they're taking mental health medication, um, you have to, it's like trial and error, like it, different things work for different people. And don't get discouraged if this medicine has a side effect that you don't work. To work with your doctor to have the correct dosage and the correct medicine. But you That's can't, the point of this. Yes, but you also can't ignore the practicality of by the time someone's charged, usually, usually they haven't had the opportunity to have that back and forth with the doctor. Right. And that's why they're in the criminal system to begin with. Yeah, but my point is I don't think you and I, who aren't doctors, um, should be dictating to Chester County Drug and Alcohol, whoever they use. I assume they have, you know, medical people um, involved, whatever course of treatment they recommend. Yes, I agree with you. And it, it was mentioned in this letter that this treatment team, this was in one of the counties, um, this was complaint B, complaint C. So complaint C was, that might have been Northumberland County? Yeah, Northumberland County. Um, and there the administering judge and treatment team, which was comprised of, you know, not only probation officers, um, but uh, uh, drug and alcohol departments and Gadencia, which is a treatment facility. So they had counselors. To me, those treatment teams, 
if to the extent that they don't already include one, should include a physician. Yeah, but well, and they do usually include a physician, but they're not prescribing Suboxone. Okay. For but well, in but that's complaining, up to the doctor. I understand. It's what I'm saying is, as lawyers, we see the practicality of it because we represent people oftentimes who are faced with drug charges and who have drug addiction issues. And when you see a letter like this from the DOJ that talks about three complainants uh, and issues in six counties because of the written policies or the counties in which the complainants come from, it opens the door to addressing other issues. And one of the issues, I mean, complainant C, she went to an inpatient treatment rehabilitation facility to be detoxed from her actual prescription. Mm -hmm. That was the issue. So I'm not dictating anything. I'm asking courts to consider. Yeah, so in any event, this is widespread throughout the, the Commonwealth. They mentioned Blair County, Butler County, Clinton County, Delaware County, York County, and there are others. We can't say definitively what, whether Chester County is, is uh, on the wrong side of this uh, uh, directive from the Department of Justice, although we have our suspicions. And I think that, like anything, I think that uh, eventually... Like, for instance, I'm, I'm an old head, right? Like, the idea, the concept of, I've come to realize that over the past, like, four or five years, I'm officially an old head. Um, Caroline gave me a look. Um, medical marijuana is foreign to me. Like, I drive by one, you know, uh, down the road, and it's just like, it's, it's a, a novelty to me, right? Um, I don't know if my child uh, or loved one had anxiety disorder that that would be the first thing that I would use it's just it's a prejudice that we carry right based upon the way that we were taught about marijuana um, but the the point is that um, I think that it'll evolve and I think you know that this letter from the Department of Justice is a good start in terms of getting our courts to understand that lawyers aren't doctors and that if doctors are prescribing a medicine stay the hell out of the way and on that note, is that it? I don't, it sounds like that was a good place yeah, to end. Good. That was a hard stop. That was a hard stop. And by the way, credit to our friend Mark Shepard, um, fellow PACDL lawyer. Former He's president. The, former president. He's the one that pointed this out to me. There was an article uh, in Spotlight PA, um, which kind of personalized these uh, individual A's or whatever they call them in this letter. And, uh, you know, a, a horror story may be a, an overstatement, but they had... They had some rough, um, a rough go of it in terms of trying to walk the line of um, staying clean on their prescribed medicine um, and trying to avoid criminal records. And they're very sympathetic. Um, and thanks, Mark, for pointing it out. Thanks, Mark. And I'll also end. Um, we're we're podcasting quite a few episodes today. I actually don't know what's going to come out first because of the timeliness of this. This might be the first one. So if you're totally confused by the intro, stay tuned for an interview with our investigator, Greg Ald. Anything else, Pete? No. All right. Signing off. <laughs>